Um, so I want to thank you for being here today as we celebrate. Now hear me, guys. As we celebrate the joy and the hope that we have in Christ. Like, think about that simple statement. The joy and the hope that we have in Christ. Both are untouched by circumstance. Both are untouched by emotion. Because some of you guys are in here today with horrible circumstances and you are not feeling good about yourself, where you're at, where your family's at, whatever. But that does not mean that you're still not walking in the joy and the hope that's in Jesus Christ. Um, and so we're here to celebrate that. How do we celebrate that? Well, we celebrate that, number one, by acknowledging that the joy and the hope of Jesus Christ is found in his resurrection. It was found in the fact that God raised him from the dead. And because God raised him from the dead, we now have the ability to have new life in him. And because of his resurrection, we know that one day we will be resurrected to live eternally with him. So that's what this day is. It's the day, it's, 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 it's the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day, the day we celebrate resurrection power. I wrote another statement I want to share with you. We share in Christ's sufferings so that we may share in his resurrection life. If you're sitting here this morning having sufferings in place in your life, if you're sitting here this morning um, feeling like your life and you are suffering, understand that that is a joyous place to be in. Why? Because Christ says that you, if you share in my suffering, you also will share in my life. And so know that this morning, as we share in his suffering, we're sharing in his resurrection life. Hey, if you're a guest here today, we want to thank you for choosing Grace Mont First Baptist Church as a place to come today. Um, our leadership team, our deacons, um, we all know that y'all chose us, and so it's a privilege to have you here. Um, we have a gift for you. It's a blue Bible in a pink basket. We've really got to change that basket. Um, but it's a blue Bible that we would like to give you uh, just as a token of our appreciation for you coming here. Uh, the truth is, if there's any way, as Brother Wayne said, who is, uh, who's our deacon, one of our deacons, another deacon is Jerry Patterson and then Gene Fogel. If there's any way that we can serve you, and when we say serve you, uh, what we mean is can we pray for you? Um, do you need food? Um, do you need uh, water? Do you need, I mean, what do you need? If you have needs, we want to serve you. We want to fill those needs. So um, if there's any way we can do that, please be sure to let us know. All right. If you got your Bibles today, and I hope you do, turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. Wayne, I want to thank you again for this OU cup. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and turn this so the camera can catch that. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, let it be known that this was a gift. Right there. Yeah. All right, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. If your body is able and you're willing, please stand in the honor of reading God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And God's word says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training and righteousness. Heavenly Father, we pray that today you will speak to us the truth that you have hidden in your holy word. We thank you that you have breathed the very life force into the scriptures that we hold. And we pray, God, that our spirit will identify, Lord, with the truths that we will uncover today and that we will walk out here different than when we walked in. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. 
So, um, it's 30 minutes. I've got exactly 30 minutes. If you're wondering, it's 30 minutes. Get ready. We're going to do 45 in 30, okay? Um, two weeks ago, we started a, um, we took a look into a passage of scripture, the same place, but the verse before. If you remember two weeks ago, we looked at second Timothy chapter three, verse 15. And it was the same time that we had our local Gideon, who's also our, our deacon and, um, a leadership team member, Jerry Patterson, um, give his presentation on what he does in the work of the Gideons. Um, and it was on that day, if you remember, uh, verse uh, 15, one verse up from where we're at today, that, that, that we made some pretty bold claims. Um, I'm going to read the verse. Verse 15. And how from childhood, remember he's continuing from verse 14, but he says, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The key truth that we communicated two weeks ago was this. The most evangelistic, missional, great commission, kingdom work a redeemed child of God can do is get the word of God into the hands of men, women, and children from the very person next door to us to the person at the farthest reaches of the earth. That is the most mission thing we can do as a church is to get the word of God into the hands of men, women, and children. And then Brother Jerry got up and he explained how his organization that he's a part of and the ministries therein accomplished that. The thousands of scriptures that are placed all over the world in hotels, prisons, schools, hospitals. Jerry told us story after story after story of how the literal word of God changed people's lives. My favorite one was when the guy was chilling on the roof, right? And, 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 and they threw the Bible, and the Bible hit the guy in the head. But that guy was on the verge of giving up. And he read it. And the scriptures made him wise unto salvation. He was born again, and his testimony is God literally hit me in the head with the word of, the word of God. That was all last uh, two weeks ago. It is only by the word of God by the power of the person of the Holy Spirit that saves a man, a woman, or a child. In summary, let me, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Uh, in summary, let me tell you the relationship that Scripture has to salvation. And again, this is what we covered two weeks ago. But this is how Scripture relates to salvation. First, the Bible reveals our need for salvation. The Bible reveals our need for salvation. It's a mirror that shows us how filthy we are in God's sight. Um, Romans uh, 3.23. Secondly, the Bible explains that every lost sinner is condemned now. Every person who is not under the Lordship of Jesus Christ is standing condemned now. If you want, if you're taking notes, write down John three eighteen through twenty one. John chapter three eighteen through twenty one. The next thing, the Bible explains that a lost sinner cannot save himself. That's important to know. Why? Because we've got religions and false doctrines surrounding our community that tells us that if you're good enough, that if you go to church enough, if you read your Bible enough, if you perform enough good deeds, that you can save yourself. And it is a lie from the pit of hell. Scripture tells us there is nothing you can do to save yourself. That presents a huge problem. But herein steps the good news, right? Herein steps the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Next, um, by, the, if, by the way, if you're taking notes, write down Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. That's, you cannot do anything to save yourself. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. The Bible explains the wonderful plan of salvation. Write down Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. John 3, 16. 
Romans 10, 8, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible reveals the plan of salvation. Next, the Bible explains assurance. Not insurance, assurance. What's that? How do I know that I'm saved? How do I stand here knowing that I'm saved? I have some very, um, very uh, close um, Mormon brother and sisters that I have compassion and love for that when I talk to them and I say, how do you know you've been good enough? There's no standard. There's no way to know. Well, the Word of God tells us how we know. It tells us in 1 John chapter 5, 9 through 13. The Bible becomes our very spiritual food for growth. The, the Bible becomes our spiritual bread, the bread of heaven. It nourishes our souls. Man, there's so many squirrels I want to chase right now. But listen, I just my heart is so full because I've, I've had so many good talks with some of you guys this week. Some of you guys are hurting. Some of you guys are searching. And here's the deal. Some of y'all are malnourished. And you know what? There was one day this week I was malnourished. I was malnourished. And here's the deal. I committed a sin this week. A sin that instantly put distance between me and God and me and my wife. And that sin kept me, because it happened at the beginning of the day, that sin kept me from the Word of God. Why? I didn't want to read my Bible. I just screwed up. And, and I continued not getting in the Word, and I became malnourished, and the rest of my day was ruined. And it's now 11.30 midnight, and I'm laying next to my wife, and my wife so patiently says, Blake, are you okay? And I finally had to come out and say, Cody, I sinned. And she said, here's her words, I love you. Can I pray for you? She grabbed my hand. She prayed for me. And that next morning I got up and I got in the book of John. That's where I'm at in my Wednesday Bible study in the morning time. And I ate the bread of God. And I felt it fill my soul. And I felt strength begin to come back into my life. And I felt courage begin to come back in my life. The Bible is the very bread that the Christian lives on. Okay, so all, all of that, that's how scriptures make you wise unto salvation. That's how verse 15 is true. Okay, all of those things. Today we're going to explore the next verse. We're going to go to verse 16. As Paul explains the most important truths concerning the word of God to be found in the word of God. Let me say that one more time so you know what I mean. Verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3 is the most important verse about the Bible in the Bible. That's worth highlighting it. <laughs> That's worth writing all over it. That's worth circling it. That's worth bookmarking it. That's worth remembering it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 is the most important verse about the Bible in the Bible. Today, we're going to see how Paul explains the most important truths concerning the Word of God. I wrote something down I want you to listen to. When people take God, God's word seriously, they inevitably realize that his word is not only something to be studied, it's not only something to be read, it's not only something to be written about, but it's something to be done. When people start to take God seriously, they realize that His Word is not only something we read, we speak, we study, but it's something we do. It's something we do. Um, let's recap the context of what's going on in verse 16. In verse 16, it comes at the end of chapter 3, and in chapter 3, Paul is encouraging Timothy about the last days, the days to come. And Paul tells Timothy, man, the people are going to freak out. The world's going to freak out. Men are become lovers of themselves. They're going to become selfish. Kids are going to rebel against their parents. 
He basically says in eight verses, he says, men and women will become idolaters, idolaters and prideful. All of that can be summed up in those two categories. And in the next set of verses, Paul tells them, well, this is how I've gotten through that time. You've watched me live faithfully. You've watched me live through persecution. And then Paul, in verse 14, turns the attention to Timothy. And he says, Timothy, you have got to hold fast to what you have been taught by your grandmother and your mother you got to hold fast to the faith that was given to you. He didn't say, Timothy, you got to reinvent the wheel. No, he said, Timothy, you got to go back and you got to hold fast to what is true. And it's the Word of God. And then we get to verse 15. And Paul says, why? Because the Word of God makes you wise unto salvation. And then we get to verse 16. And he says, not only does it make you wise into salvation, but the Word of God, all Scripture, every Word of God is God-breathed. It's breathed out by God. And it's profitable for rebuke or reproof, for correction, for teaching, for training in righteousness. And Paul tells them, listen, there's some reasons why in this crazy world, I mean, you guys know how crazy the world is. You're living in it just like I am. You saw the, all the kids that were shot and killed in Florida. You saw everything that happened um, all, uh, all this last month. I think there's been a total, the media said 18, which was an absolute lie. There has been a total of three mass school shootings since January. You guys have seen what's happened in, in church mass shootings. You've seen what's happened in sickness and epidemics and, 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 and in the craziness of, 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 of bad preachers preaching bad gospels. You've seen it. Not only that, but your family's experienced it. Your family's experienced death, heartache, suffering. So what do we do? Paul says you got to hold fast to the Word of God. You gotta know how valuable this word is. You gotta know how valuable, how intricate, how detailed, how important this is to your living in a crazy time. And so, simply, verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This will give me two, this tells us two truths, okay? This tells us number one, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. And number two, all scripture is profitable to the man, woman, and child of God. All Scripture is God-breathed, and all Scripture is profitable for the man, woman, or child of God. Number one, all Scripture is God-breathed. It says in verse 16, I don't know what your translation says, the ESV says all Scripture is breathed out by God. But in the Greek, it literally translates God-breathed. God apostrophe breathed. That's apostrophe, right, the line? Okay, good. Thanks, Joey. <laughs> but that's unique. That, that God breathed is unique. It's the only time in Scripture that, that phrase is used, in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Most theologians think Paul coined that term, God breathed. But those two words tell us so much. They tell us so much. First of all, all Scripture. Um, I've got family members who have said to me, well, how can there be so many denominations, so many differing opinions, so many different churches. So many people claiming the same truths out of the same Bible, but are living differently. How come some people sprinkle and some people baptize by submersion? How come, how come some people think they're the only ones going to heaven if you go to their church and these other people think that everyone can go to heaven? How come some people take this part of Scripture literally and the other part of Scripture, they say, well, you know, um, it, it could be flawed. Well, the reason I believe that that's the case is because there has been a failure to understand that every portion of Scripture, every dot or tittle, every comma, every period, every letter, every word from the original manuscripts, the original manuscripts are God-breathed, divinely inspired. And what you hold in your hand now, this canonized 66 books that was canonized over a period of 375 years, did this come together? 
is now the complete spoken revelation and word of God. This is it. It's divine. And here's a news flash. Truth is not relative. I know philosophy 101 tells you otherwise, but, but here's the deal. You can't say what's true for you is true for me. Or not true for me. Or it's okay for you to be a homosexual and glorify God because in this camp over here it's not a sin, but in this camp over here it is a sin. It either is a sin or it's not a sin. There's only one truth. And all we can do is base our truths on the truth. The Word of God. But here's the deal. If you don't think this is the Word of God, then you ain't going to look there. Where are you going to look? I don't know. You may look at your community. Most natural atheists that I know say, well, my standard of good is whatever uh, my society deems as good. And I'm like, well, Eskimos used to eat their babies. Is that good? So, I mean, you, you, you've got to have a standard of absolute good and truth to live by. And so Paul points out to Timothy here that all Scripture... Well, here's some interesting things. When Paul said that, did he have the letter of 2 Timothy canonized in a 66-book Bible? No. What was, what was present? I almost threw that at you, Wayne. What was present? The Old Testament, right? That's all they had. But you know what's cool? At the same time this is going on, if, you got, if you're if you taking notes, 2 Peter 3.16 says this. 2 Peter 3.16, it's Peter talking, and he's in the middle of this conversation. He's talking about Paul. Man, I would have loved to sit down at the dinner table with Peter and Paul. And Peter says, as he does in all his letters, referring to Paul, when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction and then catch this as they do the other scriptures what does that tell me even in this time and place the new testament writings of paul were already being considered as divinely inspired scripture there's another place in one of paul's letter where he quotes luke luke's gospel and he and he says luke's gospel is the same as the holy scriptures Paul says, all Scripture is what? Breathed out by God. That's a game changer. It's a game changer. Why? Because what you believe literally affects how you live. It's a game changer. If you believe that this is breathed out by God, that has great implications on your life. This is a divine inspiration this phrase breathed out by God. It brings ultimate authority upon the book that you hold in your hands if you believe it's breathed out by God. Breathed out by God, the term Paul used in the Greek, like I said, literally translates God breathed. So all scripture is God breathed. This denotes divine breath. <clears throat> oh, I've got so much I want to say. Do you remember when God, uh, Genesis, uh, I think it's in the second chapter, when they're recapping the creation account, and, and it says that God reached down and he took dust, and he formed man with his hands. And what did he do? He breathed life. God's breath is life. So when Paul says all scriptures God breathed, what he's saying is this scripture's alive. It has the very life of God within it. The very life that was breathed into you is breathed into these words. It's God breathed. It's a divine breath. It's God's life. The holy writings were given by God through human authors who penned the precise words that God desired them to select. Now listen, we can, get, we can talk about inspiration at another period. As Southern Baptists, we believe in an inspiration um, theory called verbal plenary, meaning every word inspired. 
We believe that God did not just um, overcome and stop the minds of everybody and like use them as some kind of crazy vessel to dictate his words. But what God did is he divinely inspired men to write exactly the words that God wanted done, wanted written, while at the same time maintaining the personalities and the character traits of the person who was writing. What do I mean? Well, Matthew reads different than Luke. Luke reads different than John. John reads different than Mark. Mark was a fisherman. Luke was a doctor. So, I mean, he used their personalities. Oftentimes, God did not override the personalities or wills of the human authors. Rather, God worked through them in such a way that their personalities were, pers were preserved in the writings, and yet a record was produced that was without error. Do you believe that today? That the Word of God is without error. Paul needs Timothy to understand this if he's ever to stand up straight in a crooked culture. Brethren, if you or your family are ever going to stand up straight in a crooked culture, it's not going to be without the inerrant Word of God. All Scripture is God-breathed. And secondly, all Scripture is profitable for the man, woman, or child of God. It's profitable. Do you know what that means? It's a banking term. Any bankers in here? I need a loan. It's profitable. Right? Like it's, it, it, it adds to you. Matter of fact, when you translate the word, it means useful, beneficial, advantageous, productive, sufficient. It's profitable. The word of God is profitable. The word of God is useful. The word of God is beneficial. The word of God is advantageous. The word of God is productive. The word of God is sufficient. Listen to how the Word of God is described by the psalmist in Psalm 19, 7 through 13. Just listen. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. The psalmist says that the Word of God restores the soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It endures forever. It produces righteousness. It makes rich. It delights. It rewards. It convicts. It protects. The Word of God is profitable. It's profitable. Back in our key text, 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul tells Timothy, how exactly the Word of God is profitable. He says, first of all, it's profitable for reproof. Your translation may say rebuke. It literally means to expose. It's to, it's, it's to expose sin. Or no, yours, yours, is, yours says the first one is teaching. Paul says the Word of God is profitable for teaching or doctrine. Teaching means the exact same thing as doctrine. Teaching is doctrine. It's what we know of God. It's what we know of man in this life. It is the knowledge and how to go on. How do I go on in this life? How do I get past my mother's death? How do I get past my father's death? How do I get past the death of my child? How do I get past this place in my life? How do I get past this addiction? How do me and my spouse get past this, this whatever? How do I go on? Well, Paul says the Scriptures are profitable for 
the ways in which to do that. The profitable and how to progress. It is the knowledge and how to get built up in the Christian faith. All one needs to be taught concerning his relationship with God is revealed in the inspired God-breathed Scriptures. The Scriptures provide the comprehensive and complete body of divine truth necessary for life and godliness. What does that mean? That means there is nothing that the Word of God cannot teach you in how to live your life. Does the Word talk about a strong-willed child? No, there's not no strong-willed child, child Scripture. But the Word does talk about how to be long-suffering and loving and persevering. The Word does talk about how to raise your kids. Does the Word talk about what to do when your cousin, brothers, nephews, uncles, sisters, dog bites you and you're in a civil suit? No, not exactly. But the Word of God does tell you how to love your neighbor. The Word of God does tell you how to deal with sin. There is no teaching in how to live this life that cannot be found in the Word of God. So where are you learning from? How are you doing it apart from the Word? Most of us do it by observation. Most of us survive. First of all, we never live. We are our survivors. But Christ said, listen, I came so that you can have life and life abundantly. How do I do that? I learn from the Word of God. It's profitable for doctrine, doctrine or teaching. Secondly, Paul says the Word of God is profitable for reproof or rebuke. Rebuke is to expose. Reproof is to expose wrong behavior or wrong belief. The Scripture exposes sin. Are you ready for this? Write this down. Ephesians 4, 12, 13. Ephesians 4, verses 12 through 13. There's four minutes left. I'm going to try to do it. Just in case you're wondering, it's 4 till. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Listen to this. This is in the Bible, by the way, about the Bible. Pretty cool. For the Word of God is living and active. Well, it's living. Why? Because it's God-breathed. And active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. What does that mean? That means you may be able to fool me, but you can't fool the Word of God. Verse 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Maybe you're not in the Word of God because sin is in your life. And every time you pick up the Bible, you feel naked in front of it. It's important to understand that the Word of God is a true and faithful friend and will not hesitate to point out the sin in your life. Scripture is the divine plumb line. You know what a plumb line is? I remember the first time I was working a job over in Anadarko with my buddy Sam, who's not here. I'm going to call him and give him a hard time after church. I'm going to say, where were you at? It was two minutes till, and I was talking about you. And he said, go get the plumb line out of my truck. And I'm like, plumb line? What in the world is that? I'm like, okay. I come back. I'm like, brother, ain't no fruit in your truck. So he goes over there, and he shows me. And, 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 and he shows me an old one that his dad had. And it was like this string with this weight on it that you would hold up against a building and see if it was level, if it was right. Scripture is the plumb line for our life. And so if you're not holding it up against yourself, how in the world do you know that you're living right? Not only is Scripture profitable for reproof. Thirdly, Paul says, Scripture, the Word of God, is profitable for correction. You know what's cool about God is the Word of God doesn't just tell you, hey, here's your sin. But then it comes along and it says, and here's how we deal with it. See, rebu rebuke happens when the Word of God exposes sin. But correction happens when the Word of God says, now let me tell you what to do about it. 
What do I mean? Whatever sin you have in your life right now, understand that the Word of God will identify that sin, and then the Word of God will tell you how to deal with that sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Lord God, the Lord God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Not only does it show us where we're wrong, but then it, it, it corrects us and restores us back to right place. Scripture not only rebukes or reproves, Reproofs wrong behavior, but also Scripture points the way back to godly living. And lastly, Paul says, Scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. This phrase was originally used outside of, we call it extra-biblical Greek, and all that means is, is outside of the Bible. This is the only place we see this uh, training in righteousness. It's the only place we see this in Scripture is right here. But outside of religious usage, it was used in reference to raising a kid. It was used in reference in, in, in how one trains a child for life. And that includes everything, don't it? That includes the whoopings. That includes the lovings. That includes making sure they're fed every day. That includes cleaning them up when they're dirty. That includes loving them when they're unlovely. That includes forgiving them when they've harmed you. You're equipping them for what? The day they leave your house and live their life. And what Paul is telling Timothy is this book will equip you to live a godly life. It will equip you. Scripture provides positive training. Um, I think of that verse. I have hidden your word in my heart. I may not sin against you. It keeps me in godly living. So, in summary, Scripture is profitable for showing you what is right, for showing you what is not right, for showing you how to get right, and then showing you how to stay right. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. It's worth something. It's worth investing in. I'm going to end with the same quote I opened up with as our invitation team comes forward. When people take God seriously, they inevitably realize that His Word is not only something to be studied, not only something to be read, not only something to be written about, but it's something to be done. Next week, we're going to go to the next verse. Next week, we're going to look at verse 17. And we're going to talk about how the Word of God equips us for every good work. I love you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love and your mercy. And God, there's so much going on in this room, Father. There's so many lives that have come to this intersection of church. And every one of us are going to leave here in a second, Father. And we're all going to go back to our corners. And what's really going to matter, God, is whether or not we have um, taken action on what we've heard. So, Father, how, how does that work, Lord? How do I grab a hold of these truths? Will you tell me, Father, the first thing that I do is I just I realize that this Word of God is divinely inspired by you, that you breathed life into it, and that it has the ability to give me life. And then, God, the next thing I do is I just get into it. I just, I just read it. And if I don't know where to read, then I come to church. And that's what church is so cool for. It tells us what to read. So, God, let us use these tools that you've given us because if the truth be told, all we do is make excuses. That's all we do. I don't got time. I'm too busy. I work too long. I'm tired. I'm this. I'm that. We do what we want to do. So God, let us want to do your word. Because if that is our passion, we will make sure everything in the world stops for it. Because we do the same thing when we want to take the family to the lake. Or we do the same thing, God, when we want to take the family to the game. We'll get up early. We'll stay up late. We'll do, we'll do the impossible for what we want. So, Father, may your word be what we want. And may the fellowship of believers be what we want. God, forgive me for my sin. I pray for those in this room, Lord, that need salvation today. Father, that they would just cry out to you in faith and repentance. 
that, Father, they'll just believe in their heart that God raised, that you raised Jesus from the dead, and that they will place themselves at Christ's feet, that they will confess him as Lord. We love you now, God, and um, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, as he comes forward, I know for sure if, uh, Kayla, if you'll come forward,